Today, we're going to talk about traffic AI in Cities Skylines 2. Now, this is something that could get super technical. It doesn't get too crazy. It's not too difficult to understand. The feature highlights video and the developer insights video do a really good job of breaking down how everything works. And obviously, I've got some information from my own experiences with City Skylines 2 as well that we can talk about. But I will say, and I do discuss this a little bit more towards the end of the video, I think traffic AI is something that we're very quickly going to take for granted. I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean to say that we're going to ignore it or neglect it. I just mean that from my experience and from what we're going to see in this video, traffic AI in City Skylines 2 just works. It does so many of the things that we wanted it to do in City Skylines 1. And so it's just not going to be something we think about after a couple of weeks of playing the game because it just works. People are the lifeblood of your city. As they move through it, they set the city's pulse, not in the cold rhythms of code, but with the variability and pace of a real city. So you should expect the same order and chaos that emerges when countless individual decisions are made all at once. It's a level of vibrant realism you've never seen before. And it's powered by the deep simulation of Traffic AI. So Traffic AI is obviously the artificial intelligence that's handling the traffic in City Skylines 2. And traffic in City Skylines 1 was also handled by AI, just not quite as advanced as it is in City Skylines 2. I think we all became quite familiar with the fact that, you know, you would build a nice big six lane avenue and all of your traffic would sit in just one lane. You could build the most beautiful of highway systems and your traffic would come to a full stop before merging into a neighboring lane. It did become a bit of a problem in City Skylines. It was probably just a feature of the times. The game is almost nine years old at this point, so expecting a super modern, super refined traffic AI system was maybe a little bit much, but it's good that part two of these feature highlights is addressing this. I like that this is something they're immediately going out there and saying, hey, we hear you, we heard you, here's what we're doing, let's talk about it. How people move from A to B in your city is called pathfinding. Previously, pathfinding meant choosing the shortest route by distance. I don't know if it was ever confirmed that City Skylines 1 had its traffic routed based on distance. I'm sure it was somewhere, but I'm going to take this as the official confirmation that that was in fact the case. I know there were theories about it, but this is confirmation. And this explains the importance of the Old Town policy in City Skylines 1. Obviously, for those of you that don't know, the Old Town policy would keep people from traveling through a district unless they were going to somewhere within that district. And it basically prevented cases where you would have these beautiful ring roads and arterial roads and all that good stuff. But people would still insist on taking the alleys and side streets through your districts. I'm assuming that that's going to be slightly changed in City Skylines 2. I haven't actually played around with the districts too much myself just yet, but I'm excited to get on with that. I'm excited to see what else gets said in this video. And I'm really curious to see exactly how they're going to be routing traffic in City Skylines 2. But ignoring factors like travel time and traffic congestion was less than ideal. Pathfinding has changed. In City Skylines 2, four main factors influence how people move through your city. These factors are called pathfinding costs. People weigh up these costs to decide where to go and how to get there. The path with the lowest cost is the path they choose. But how people weigh up these costs is very different. To help you understand, let's walk through the four pathfinding costs. Now, I don't know if pathfinding costs is a technical term or if it's something they've coined for City Skylines 2, but I love the idea that essentially the path of lowest cost is going to be the path of least resistance and therefore the most appealing path for individual citizens within your city. Instantly, it sounds like a massive improvement over how City Skylines 1 did things. And it does draw some comparisons to SimCity 2013 in the sense that SimCity 2013 was probably the most basic traffic pathfinding system of any <laughs> of any city builder in the last 15 years. If you're not aware, we'll try and cover this really quickly. Uh, in, in SimCity 2013, 
there was no permanent residence or employment for any of your sims. The way the game calculated it was here is a sim that needs a job. What is the nearest job? Here is a sim that needs a house. What is the nearest house? So they would go to a different job, a different house every single day. Whereas obviously City Skylines 1 doesn't do that. And it sounds like City Skylines 2 is going to build upon what the first game did and just do it even better. Time is usually the most important pathfinding cost. Everyone will pick their quickest route to their destination if they can. Comfort is another pathfinding cost. Who doesn't want a smooth journey? Wouldn't you avoid tricky intersections if you could? The first two factors when it comes to pathfinding being time and comfort are kind of really interesting. Obviously, time is self-explanatory. It is how long does it take to get there in a, you know, relative to time itself. But comfort is an interesting one as well. Obviously, there's a mention there of intersections and avoiding complicated intersections. So that's a really interesting way to sort of, I guess, frame city building is, you know, obviously you can be super, maybe optimal isn't the word, but you can be super extra. You can be a, a genius engineer and build the most complex, beautiful, twisting and turning intersections that you possibly can but your people might not want to use it because it has too many twists and turns, too many intersections. That's going to be a really fun balancing act. The availability, convenience, and cost of parking will now impact where people choose to go and how to get there. Easy parking is actually the deciding factor for some people when choosing where to socialize and spend their money. That's another pathfinding cost, money. Fuel, parking, and public transport tickets can seriously add up. So it's a factor in where people choose to go and how they get there. Oh, I like this. I like that we can talk about something that I talked about in yesterday's episode. That being that parking is something that your sims are actually going to need now. There is a need for good parking in commercial spaces. I, I would assume residential spaces, offices, industrial, and all of that good stuff. So that's cool that it's touched upon. And that's cool that it's a factor in the pathfinding for your sims as well. What's also interesting is that they factor in cost of travel, that being fuel, public transport fares, and so on and so forth. So I would imagine that might imply that sims who are a little bit less well off might be a little less inclined to travel on expensive public transport or long distance because of fuel costs. That's a really interesting way of just sort of taking the economy simulation and applying it to how people get around. And I don't know how much people have talked about this, but that is a ridiculous level of depth in the pathfinding system alone. That is, wow, there's, there's a lot there that could factor into just how your people get around. The final factor influencing pathfinding is behavior or how likely people are to engage in risky maneuvers on the road. U-turns, lane hopping, and speeding can reduce travel times, lower fuel consumption, and avoid some of the inconvenient aspects of travel. To keep pathfinding costs low, people will reroute if something happens on their journey. For example, if they get caught behind a traffic accident that takes too long to clear, they'll find another way to get where they're going. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. I love the idea. <laughs> I love the idea that my road management could be so bad that someone commits a misdemeanor or a felony. That's that's kind of funny. Obviously, you know, U-turning isn't a felony, but I, I love that someone will violate traffic laws if your road layout is so bad. That's actually kind of hilarious, and I love it, and I look forward to seeing what kind of chaos happens in my cities. Now, speaking of chaos, obstructions are obviously a thing, and they have been a thing in City Skylines 1 as well. Obviously, you know, relatively limited, but you could have situations where a building on a road would catch fire and you would see all of your traffic start to U-turn. Now, not necessarily in the way that it does in City Skylines 2, but it was a thing. And it's kind of cool that that's also going to be a factor in how people get around because it means that it's even more dynamic than it otherwise was. If there's a huge traffic jam somewhere, people might be like, well, it's going to take ages to go that way, so I'm going to go the other way. It might lead to things like ring roads being even more useful than they otherwise were. It means that, I guess, 
in theory, if there's sort of a rush hour in City Skylines 2, which I haven't noticed myself, but if there was, you know, if there's a particularly busy time of day, maybe there's an event, maybe there's something like that going on, then your people might be inclined to say, hey, downtown is packed with traffic right now. Instead of going through it, I'm going to go around it. I'm going to take the ring road. That would be really cool. Hang on. Traffic accidents? Afraid so. Drivers can lose control and crash their vehicles into traffic and buildings. Yikes. You see, things like wet roads, extreme weather events, and the time of day can increase the risk of a collision. But it's actually poor road conditions that should keep you awake at night. Want to reduce the risk of serious mishaps? Send your road maintenance crew out ASAP. Now, I think I mentioned traffic accidents briefly in episode one of this series, but obviously this is a bit more of a focus on those, and they are another form of obstruction that's going to stop your traffic from going through somewhere. And traffic accidents are interesting because they are caused by slippery roads, snow, and just general wear and tear on your roads as well. And I like this because it means that the road maintenance depot and road maintenance in general is no longer going to feel like an optional extra, which it kind of did in City Skylines 1. I don't remember how many times I've built road maintenance depots, but it's probably something I could count on one hand since they were added to the game, I think, in Snowfall. I just like that this is another level of simulation, another level of detail, and another level of management for your cities. Something I've always said about City Skylines 1 is that it very quickly becomes a city painter. I've always called it a city painter. I know some people call it a city builder in the sense that you're just building a city. And there's been some criticisms about the management in City Skylines 1 being kind of irrelevant after the first 30 to 60 minutes. That's not the case in City Skylines 2 in the slightest. From my experience playing it, from the videos I've seen from the gameplay I've put out, I think it's fair to say that it does have a much deeper management aspect to it. And road maintenance is just another spoke on that wheel, I guess, is how we'll call it. And I like, I like that. I like that it's not an optional extra. Traffic AI has improved pathfinding so much that you can now grow a larger population. But remember, a big population brings opportunities and challenges. Two info views can help you plan and react when life takes a left turn. Traffic info view takes the guesswork out of traffic management. It delivers a real-time overview of how much traffic is on your road network and traffic so you can resolve problems quickly. Now, on the topic of a larger population, that is something people have been pointing out since the very first teaser for Cities Skylines 2. And the sense of scale in this game is actually kind of wild. You've probably seen it in the gameplay videos. You've probably seen it in the dev diaries, in the feature highlights, in the live streams. It's kind of wild. There's a lot of room for you to build a lot of things. A lot of buildings are huge now. Just the cemetery alone is about the size of many of the, I guess, town centers that we'd build in City Skylines 1. So not only is your population going to scale differently, your buildings scale differently. and it's just really interesting. Again, I, I used this term earlier. It feels like a natural evolution from where we were in the first game to where we're going with the second game. And I really appreciate that. It does feel like a true sequel. It doesn't feel like they went, hey, you know, forget that. We're going to do something totally different, but slap the City Skylines name on here. That's not the case. This is a true sequel. It just feels like it's taken so much of that first game and gone, let's do that but bigger, better, and with more polish. Deep simulation transforms the movement of people, goods, and services through your city into the pulsing reality of a living, breathing city. But how people choose their path? That is always a response to the world around them. A world of your creation. And so that concludes the feature highlights section of the video. We will, of course, be getting into the developer insights in just a moment, but I wanted to take a second to talk about traffic AI and how it feels in City Skylines 2, because it's all well and good to sit and say, hey, here's this technical thing. Here's that technical thing. Here's all this information that sounds awesome. But does it feel good to play? It does. 
I mean, that's not to say that City Skylines 1 was completely unsatisfying. There were definitely moments where you would solve problems with your traffic and it would just flow amazingly. And it's very, very satisfying to sit back and look at that. But City Skylines 2 just feels more fluid. It feels more dynamic and it's more satisfying to just look at your traffic and notice that, hey, you know, they're making these little decisions based on things that are going on around the city. You know, why did that guy go that way when that guy went that way? And they're both sort of heading to roughly the same place. There is a really detailed simulation going on under there. And obviously my ability to manage traffic in cities is limited at best. We'll definitely say limited. But even I can build something in City Skylines 2 that functions pretty well. And I think this is going to be one of those cases where... It is the game sort of holding my hand a little bit and going, don't worry, I got you. You're going to be all right. Give me a little pat on the shoulder and saying, you're all right. I got you. We'll figure this out together. Whereas City Skylines 1 is, you know, more like, uh, <laughs> it's more like sending a tod toddler up a ladder to re-roof a house or something like that. I don't know. City Skylines 1 is a little bit more unforgiving than City Skylines 2 when it comes to traffic. It just sort of sits back with a beer and goes, ah, and, you know, watches as your city burns down. <laughs> Let's talk about Traffic AI. In City Scanners 1, the agents chose their pathfinding based on how close they are to something where they want to go. In City Scanners 2, the agents actually calculate their pathfinding cost. And that pathfinding cost is based on multiple different factors. The pathfinding consists of four major factors. The first one is time. The agents, all agents, be it citizens or trucks or anything in the city, they will always calculate how long it takes to travel from one place to the other. And this can be uh, the speed of the road or the vehicle or uh, walking or public transportation that they use. So right away, there is a lot to unpack about what's just been said. Speed limits are a factor in how your sims are going to decide to go somewhere. The availability of public transport is a factor in how they're going to go somewhere. And obviously, we've already talked about the fact that the cost of travel is a factor in that as well. So I would imagine you could, in theory, create the most amazing network of public transportation services and set the cost of those services to be so high that people are like, nah, not going to bother. But on the flip side, I wonder if it then sort of calculates based on the price being nothing. So if your public transport isn't that good, but the price is free, are they going to sort of look at it and go, well, you know, why not? How bad can it be? And this is the major factor in deciding which way they want to travel. Another important factor in pathfinding is comfort, which means how many turns they have to make, how near the parking is, is there something else that affects their comfortness of the road. Now, I do like that this video is clarifying something from the feature highlights video, which is that comfort is essentially how many turns they have to take, but it's also parking. I didn't really think about that. I didn't think about parking in the sense of it being an extension of comfort itself, but that makes sense. Obviously, it's one of the biggest pains in the butt whenever you have to park really far away from wherever you're wanting to go. And it's a more comfortable and pleasing experience when you can park right next to the place that you want to go. But obviously, from a city building and aesthetic point of view, you don't necessarily want parking lots everywhere. So that's going to be an interesting thing to balance. Money, 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 money is also an important factor in the pathfinding. Money is usually about fuel costs for citizens, and it can also be ticket fees if they use public transportation. And once again, we're getting confirmation of something that was mentioned in the feature highlights in that it's fuel costs and it's the cost of public transportation, which you can absolutely change on the fly per public transport line. So 
if you have, I guess, a tram line in this case that's performing worse than you'd like it to, I imagine that lowering the cost is going to make it a little bit more appealing. Now, that's not to say that you can make a terrible public transport line and just have everybody love it by making it free. But I think it is fair to say that there is a balancing act there. The better your public transport, the more you can charge for it. The worse your public transport, the less you charge for it. But people might still be inclined to, I guess, feel sorry for you is, is what I'm getting at. I don't know. <laughs> and then last but not least is the behavior. Most agents in the city follow all the normal traffic laws right on the right side of the road and don't make uh, rash decisions in traffic. But certain vehicles, these being the emergency vehicles, can in certain cases do more dangerous uh, decisions in, in traffic, such as making U-turns and thus cutting the travel time to their destination if they are responding to emergencies. I love this. I love seeing ambulances and police cars and fire trucks and just the emergency services in general being a little bit more realistic in how they deal with things. No longer are you going to be seeing an ambulance just zoom the entire way down an avenue that has a median in the middle uh, and have to go all the way around the block to get to an emergency on the other side of the road. If there's an intersection, they'll just pop a Yui and head back up the road to the emergency. That's that's a really cool little detail. And I also want to say that the way the vehicles move and lean and tilt and sort of bob and weave on the road is really satisfying to look at. I don't know if it's just me, but I love that. But also, I'm a really big fan of cars that do that in general. A little bit of body roll just gives it some character. It kind of reminds me of like old movies from like the, well, I say old. It reminds me of like cop movies from the 80s and like the 90s where, you know, you'd have like a car going up over a ramp on that one hill in San Francisco and it's just like bobbing and weaving and bouncing and stuff like that. It just looks cool, man. And sometimes some citizens can go through traffic lights on the old greens, so to speak, trying to sneak in on the last second before the traffic turns, the traffic light turns to red. In pathfinding, different age groups value different things. For example, teens value money because they have none. Adults value time because they have so little of it. And seniors prefer the comfort because they are in their leisure time of the year. <laughs> you know what I really love about this? This felt like an opportunity for a really dark joke there. And uh, I, <laughs> I feel like it was acknowledged and might have been edited out of the video. That feels like that feels like it would have been an opportunity for me to say something that was wildly, wildly inappropriate. But I do like that the age groups are factored into the simulation as well. I don't think that was mentioned at all in the feature highlights, but it means that people that are, for example, going to school, if you've got, you know, teens and young adults that are going to university or whatever it might be, if they don't have as much money, then that might imply that the public transport lines that you have servicing your education facilities might have to be cheaper than public transport lines that are servicing, say, tourism industries. Obviously, tourists, you would think, would come with money. Your students are going to be broke because they're students. So... That's a really interesting way of, of weighing things up, and it's something I hadn't really thought about. And I don't know how exactly you would balance that. I guess it's one of those impossible tasks. Your, your students are broke, so they want free public transport. You're, you've got your adults who have no time to do anything, and so they want to get places quickly. And you've got your old people who are falling apart and want everything to be comfortable. That's a really interesting challenge, and I hadn't thought about that at all for building a city, but I love the idea of trying to juggle all of those age groups. Road lanes, yes, they are still in city skylines too. Now the vehicles will use all the lanes available for them. So if you have a traffic light intersection where one lane is filled with cars now, the other cars will pick the open lanes and then fill that intersection evenly. And there's our confirmation that traffic will actually use all of the lanes where possible in the run up to an intersection. It's just, 
it's so nice to know that in just a few weeks time, we're not going to have to worry about how traffic in City Skylines 1 will only use one lane. Even if you have six lanes that are going in a single direction, they'll still just use one. And it's been like that for eight and a half years. And as much as I love that game, I'm just so keen to not have to deal with that problem anymore. Oh, traffic accidents. Oh, traffic is that so cool feature. This can be caused by poor road condition, lighting condition, weather, and natural disasters. Traffic accidents happen and the car loses a control, which can also then lead to bigger traffic jams. To lower the chance of traffic accidents, the players can add traffic lights and also keep the roads in good condition. There's honestly probably not too much more to say about traffic accidents other than what has been said, which is that they do happen, but there are a variety of ways that you can counter traffic accidents and reduce the likelihood of one happening, that being road maintenance, but that also being stuff that we talked about in the road tools video yesterday, that being your stop signs, your traffic lights, no right turns, no left turns, etc, etc. And obviously they are an obstruction that your people are going to have to get around, but that's fine. So long as you've got a robust road network, they'll have no problem doing that. And if you don't, there's just going to be a traffic jam until it gets cleared out. And that's, 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 that's on you or me. It's probably on me. My road networks aren't that good. Traffic info view shows the overall state of the city's traffic. It shows the traffic flow, the traffic volume of the city, etc., etc. The road info view itself is kind of like two-parter. The one info view is about the whole city. Then you can also select individual roads and see their own road info view and all information about that in more in depth. And you can also see traffic flow and volume of that particular street or road. Honestly, the road info view just seems like a beautifully expanded version of a similar feature from City Skylines 1. Obviously, the option was there in that game to click on a road and sort of see where everybody's going, but it wouldn't necessarily highlight it the way it does here. It certainly didn't give you a graph to look at either, which is very, very satisfying to see. It certainly didn't tell you about the road condition the way it does here. It didn't tell you the length either. This is just this is just cool. This is just a really, really satisfying way of of looking at your roads. It's also interesting that the traffic volume graph seems to be based on time with a bit of a spike there at what looks to be four o'clock. So that kind of makes me wonder if the game maybe does have rush hours. I don't necessarily think it's going to be in the way that like SimCity 4 would do it. I don't think it's going to be a super obvious thing, but it does imply that there are going to be times during the day where your roads are going to be a little bit busier. And that's going to sort of feed back to what I said earlier about maybe pushing your Sims to go, hey, downtown is packed. Let's take the ring road. There are different types of service vehicles. Some are responding to a call, like ambulances, for example. And then there are some service vehicles which are just patrol the city, like police cars or garbage vehicles which are collecting garbage. Players can choose from the district info panel which service buildings are working inside the district. They can choose the service building and work in multiple districts. It's also a very good feature because that was also requested in City Skylines 1 fans. Uh, it's one of, one of my favorites and it also helps manage the city a lot better because you can control where the city service is actually affecting. For example, if you want to have other side handled by the whole police and other side of the city has different services, you can control where they are affecting. Now, this is huge. This is something I have wanted in City Skylines since day one. So I am thrilled about the fact that you can assign your emergency services, your services in general, to specific districts. It means that you are no longer going to have situations where a fire truck from the east side of the city is trying to get to the most northwesterly point to put out a fire if it's assigned to a district. Now, there might be an overwrite in there. I'm not really too sure where it says, hey, that's the only truck available, get going. But at the very least, being able to assign your services to a district is just 
it's a way to just make that district a little bit more self-sufficient in a way. You don't necessarily want to go and say, hey, every district has a police department, every district has a school, every district has a fire department and a hospital. But it's nice that you have that option. And it's nice that you can say, hey, assign this, you know, medical clinic to this district, assign this medical clinic to that district, but assign that hospital to the four or five districts surrounding it. So you could micro on that level where you give them a small medical facility, a small firehouse, and then things like hospitals and fire stations and police headquarters are then assigned to multiple districts in the area. It's just a level of control that makes the simulation that much deeper. And honestly, it's interesting that it's coming up in a traffic AI video. Obviously, it does have implications. Your traffic is going to be within that district. But this is something that has impacts across the entire simulation in City Skylines 2. And I love that about it. Just like in City Skylines 1, City Skylines 2 also features traffic between other cities in the form of traffic traveling from one outside connection to the next. These vehicles can contribute to the traffic in your city if they find a route cheaper and faster through the city instead of one of the highways. If the player city is exporting certain city service vehicles at outside connection, the player can get monetary income from that exporting service. On the other hand, if the player is lacking some city service, they can import it from the outside connection, but for a fee, of course. And once again, this is something that's interesting to have in a video about traffic AI because it does seem like it goes a lot deeper than that. It is something that I talked about in my gameplay video as well, which I will try to remember to link in the video description. I think it was linked in the first episode as well, so do feel free to check that out. It's, it's interesting that outside connections with regards to services are mentioned as a way to make money because you can do the same with things like power as well. That's why in my gameplay video, I connected my power plant to the outside connection for power. And if we were generating excess power, we would export it for some money. I wasn't aware you could do that with your services as well. That is something that is really similar to SimCity 2013, except in SimCity 2013, you were exporting it to either your other cities or other people's cities that were in the same session as you. I just, I just like that. I just like the sense of there being a bit of a bigger world outside of just your, your city, outside of your region. And obviously that was a thing in City Skylines 1. You could have vehicles coming from other cities and you don't ever see those cities. You don't see them in City Skylines 2 either, but it's a nice feeling that you have a bit more control. And that's something that I had to learn in my gameplay video as well. I built a train station and there were no regional trains coming through and I was wondering why not and it turns out that you do in fact have to make those connections they aren't a thing by default so I suppose that's why it's important for a traffic AI video because it gives you more control over your traffic and that's just kind of cool And so that brings us to the end of the Developer Insights video as well. I am blown away. And I say that having played City Skylines 2. I've played it, and I played it before I watched this, this video. I've played it before I watched any of these developer diaries. It's just interesting hearing about the way the AI is going to work. It's interesting hearing about things that I wasn't aware of just through playing the game. So... That's, oh man, I'm just excited to play around with it more and more. I'm honestly not even just excited about that. I'm excited to see what other people do. I'm excited to see what the people on YouTube that are experts in traffic management and experts at building these super realistic cities are able to do with this. And I want to see what the traffic AI does when you have a realistic city, when you have something that's maybe a recreation of somewhere that exists in the real world because it would be interesting to see just how, I suppose, complex the traffic AI actually is. And that's something I might, I might play around with that one day. Maybe I'll build a city that's in the UK somewhere. I might build maybe my hometown or something. I don't know. That'd be a bad idea to build my hometown. But regardless, we could play around with it and see what happens. And I'm just excited to see what everybody does. I think traffic AI is something that people are going to not necessarily take for granted, but I think it's something people are going to very, very quickly forget about because it works so well. If you think about it this way, how many times do you think to 
compliment something, right? You you kind of don't. And that's not uh, that's not a black mark against anybody. That's not to say that people are wrong for not doing that. But generally, we as people don't necessarily point out when things work as intended. We're more inclined to point something out when it's wrong. And so I think people, I think the conversation around traffic AI is very quickly going to go away because it just works. And that's a good thing in a, in a sense. That's not to say that it doesn't deserve a massive amount of credit. It absolutely does. It's just done so well that it's not going to be something you think about because it just works. And on that note, we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. It has been an absolute pleasure. As always, let me know what you think. Let me know about what you're most excited about when it comes to traffic management in City Skylines 2. And as always, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.